Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Alyssa Williams. Uh, thank you for having me here um, this evening. And I've just made like a quick slide. Um, I'm just going to be talking about some of the work um, we've been doing on Black Lives Matter Toronto Coalition. Um, so how many of y'all have heard of um, our coalition? By just show of hands. OK. So we're doing pretty good getting our name out there. Um, so essentially, I'm, I'm only going to talk for five minutes and just show you um, just like a timeline of the stuff that we have done um, so far. And pretty much just so you know, the group, um, we're just a group of activists in Toronto. We're made up of uh, students, teachers, uh, women, uh, queer folks, trans folks. Um, that's just like the majority of the makeup of our team. And uh, we pretty much came together for the first time um, last November. So after the um, no indictment result of the Mike Brown um, uh, case in the US. So that was when we basically just came together and we decided out of need, we needed to do something. We needed to do some sort of like action. Um, so we just pulled our resources together and we said, you know what, we're going to do, we're going to do this. We made a Facebook event and then suddenly 100 people turned into like 5,000. So it was really um, amazing to see that. Um, so I'm just going to go through the slides so you get like a quick visual of the um, events we've done in the past leading to now. And then I'm going to talk about future uh, things that we're working on right now. OK, so this is just like a, you know, how we define ourselves, um, seeking justice from state sanctioned violence. Um, and then I just put this image in there from a Time magazine cover from July, which I found was really effective um, in that, you know, we're in 2015 and the whole idea that, um, you know, we've left all of those, uh, like, all of those um, really negative, like, racist, all of, like, stereotypical um, attitudes and ideals behind, and the system is actually, like, getting better, but uh, that's not the case at all. So I just thought it was a really powerful image, and I wanted to include it in there. So this is um, just a summary of the actual actions we've done in terms of demonstrations. Just one thing I wanted to point out, a lot of the... Um, the events and actions that we have planned, we weren't able to like publicize them like before we did it because we weren't sure in terms of a lot of things depend on how much people show up. And another thing too is that um, you don't want the, for example, being outside the police, uh, the US um, consulate, um, for example, like that's a pretty risky uh, action to take on because we weren't allowed to be too close to it, um, but we kind of just went ahead anyways. So we had to take some risks there, even like um, shutting down like the Allen Road. Like that was a big thing where we had to be very, you know, secretive about it before we did it. But we knew we wanted to interrupt a big space and we wanted to have our voices heard. So, you know, it's pretty important. So just keep that in mind in terms of like grassroots actions. A lot of things that you, you won't see being done because we're not really allowed to talk about it because it affects the success of the, of the action. And then these are just a couple of events, uh, collaborations that we've done. So we've collaborated with the Art ga um, Gallery of Ontario and a different book list, which is the bookstore. And then we recently did the Take Back the Night March with the Toronto Rape Crisis Center. Um, and that was really successful as well. So just to show you all we're out there and we're doing community stuff. And this is how you can get in touch with our group. And um, yeah, we're usually um, available over email. Um, and you can message us on Facebook as well if you want to get involved, if you want to volunteer. Right now, we have a petition online um, to stop police carding. So um, pretty much the, um, on the government has released regulations on this practice, but we're actually calling for a complete stop of it. Because we know that black folks are disproportionately, and people of color, visible, um, minorities are disproportionately affected by police checks so we want to make sure that the practice stops altogether and so we um a uh, one of our co-founders sandy hudson um actually put an article in toronto star about how the regulations are not helping the actual problem so if you want more information and to get educated about the issue you should um definitely read that 
uh, and then just keep in touch with us um, for that, sign the petition. Um, we also have an action coming up. Um, I won't give you all the details about it, but it's just around the schoolgirl who um, was scolded for wearing her natural hair at school right here in Toronto. So we're going to be doing something around that soon. So definitely look out for us. Um, and does anyone have like any questions or anything? No? Okay, well that's it from me. Um, like I said, thanks for having me, um, thanks for having us. Uh, and you can keep in touch with us um, by any of these means. And yeah. And next we have Chris from uh, the amazing Ryerson group, the Racialized Students Collective. Hey folks, uh, so my name is Chris. I'm one of the coordinators at the Racialized Students Collective. So the Ryerson Students Union has six equity service centers and the Racialized Students Collective is one of them. So basically the work that we do is um, challenge racism really on campus in society, um, but it's also a space where we intentionally center, center uh, racialized voices, racialized experiences. So we do have meetings that are for racialized students only, um, and also events that are open to the campus in general so that we can do some education work as well, because realistically, uh, we need everybody to engage in this, in this fight against racism. I just came from a workshop where I was talking about trans inclusiveness in the black liberation movement. It was a lot. Um, you know, these, these spaces don't exist. Uh, these are, not many of them exist. At the same time, it makes sense because if these spaces were, you know, plentiful, then we'd be admitting that there's a problem. So what we do is we take that in consideration and we do it unapologetically. So at the Racialized Students Collective, oh, sorry. At the Racialized Students Collective, um, we will never turn away a racialized student that needs to come talk. And also we work very hard at uh, educating. We're generally the voice on campus that will, you know, handle anything racist in the media. So like racist journalist or um, anything happening like student, right, white students union or whatever, that's generally us. We're not actually a, a body of the university. Uh, we work with the students union. And so yeah, we center the voice of racialized students. You should get involved. Um, it's also a space where we're more critical. We're cr critical of our own communities. We're critical of ourselves. We really work through a lot of different issues and we approach the work from an intersectional lens. Um, and we work at making our own communities inclusive. Um, for whatever that means. So yeah, unpacking, unlearning, relearning, and also sharing. We need to create spaces for healing, we need to create spaces for these conversations, we also need to do it unapologetically, and that's what the Racialized Students Collective plans to do. We have different events all the time, check us out, we have cool posters. Uh, we have an event coming up December 1st, it's a movie night. Generally, our movie nights are pretty awesome, we watch movies and then have like the dopest conversations, it's pretty sweet. Um, so come through, if you're about it, have a good event. Thank you, Chris and Alyssa, for sharing information about the important work that you do. And now, please join me in welcoming Deanna Bowen. Wow, wait, thank you. Ooh, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not that, not that one. Okay, let me just close this PowerPoint when I can find my mouse. And I will go into... Okay, so just going to set this up a little bit. Um, so I've been to Ryerson and, give, and gave talks about this body of work in some iteration, one iteration or another, a couple of times now. So there's some people in the room that have seen some of this, so I apologize for that. Um, but at the same time, uh, I couldn't help, just I pay attention to the news, uh, I couldn't help but draw some connections between the work that I produce and the things that are going on in the world right now. So I'm going to try my darndest to make some connections between this body of work that is largely about my family's migration into the country uh, at the turn of the century and connect that to uh, the influx of Syrian refugees, largely as far as Canadian pushback against that. Uh, obviously, Black Lives Matter uh, in Toronto and in the United States specifically, I'm thinking about the shooting in Minneapolis uh, last night, uh, last night, today. 
Um, and then also I'm thinking about uh, Truth and Reconciliation report that came out in Canada and the uh, Conservative government's pushback against investigating uh, or starting an investigation in uh, the thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women. So there are reasons for this. I'll unpack it in the presentation itself. So if we can kill the lights, if that's possible. Is it me? No, nope. there we go. Okay, cool. Okay, um, I this is up for a while. I'm not going to read this to you, but this certainly these two quotes are kind of cornerstones in the work that I do and the kind of core idea ideology behind what I do. Uh, the top is uh, a quote by Dory Laub, who is a Holocaust um, theorist, uh, activist, uh, academic, and also a psychoanalysis who can, can, um, collects oral histories of Holocaust survivors. So that's the first part. Uh, the second part is actually a direct quote from my great uncle, uh, Bodhi. Uh, and this is really him just talking about my great grandparents as they came into the country and their, their ideas about what Canada uh, was supposed to be. So I'm just going to, I'll come back to this. I'm, hopefully you read some of this, but just I want to get moving on the presentation itself. Uh, and then the other thing I want to flag also is that what I'm going to do, this is a little bit different, hopefully, for the people that have seen this before. I'm reading an excerpt from a chapter of a book that will be published uh, next year in uh, an art history book put together by Professor Charmaine Nelson at McGill University. And so that book is, uh, I will pr uh, put the title up. Uh, at the end of the presentation, but this is just a piece of it. Uh, and it was the best way for me to figure out how to make some connections to things that are happening con uh, in contemporary society now. Uh, and then I will break after I've read this little clip and I'll just talk about the work specifically. So the first part is a bit of a preamble, the stuff that sets up the making of the work. So no matter the artistic manifestation, my work has always been about this photo. Uh, this is a picture of my family in front of our home in Vancouver's East End in the mid-1970s. Uh, my grandparents, Reverend Albert and Jean Bowen Risby, are at the center of the cluster. My eldest aunt, Aldith, uh, is to my grandmother's left, and my youngest and favorite aunt, Barbara, flanks my grandfather to the right. My cousin, Clayton, who was more like my little brother, and I are crouched in the front of them as my mother, Leora, frames the picture behind the camera lens. For many years now, the unspoken dynamics of this photo, my mother removed, uh, Clayton and I flanked by a confusingly fluid network of young and very old surrogate parents, has formed the basis of my art practice. I began my research, the research, uh, the work of making sense of us shortly after my grandfather, uh, my grandmother and grandfather died in 1993 and 1994 respectively. Mama and Daddy's passing was and still is a catastrophic loss that signaled the end of a very particular way of being. Though we lived in Vancouver, our roots were in Alberta, uh, Amber Valley, Calgary, Campsie, Edmonton, Newbrook, and Fort McMurray. Our deeper roots reached into all black towns like Clearview, Oklahoma, and Abilene, Kansas. Our roots reached deeper still into the soil of plantations in Pine Flat, Alabama, and Trigg County, uh, Kentucky. And yet, with all of this journeying, no one in my clan ever spoke of what was left behind. We talked very little about race or blackness, said even less about slavery and violence, and yet we knew that we came from the States to build a new life. We were raised to believe in the promised land that Canada was a far better place than we had or could have been. Mom and Daddy spoke often but sparingly of the hardships their parents, my great-grandparents Willis and Jeannie Bowen Sr., and my great-great-grandparents Sam Henry and Margaret Risby had endured when they fled Oklahoma and Kansas to live in the black settlements of Amber Valley and, Kansas, and Campsie in the early 1900s. In hindsight, I can detect their acts of self-censure, can hear the hidden mes messages between the few things Mama and Daddy were willing to detail. They both insisted that relations between blacks and whites were good in Amber Valley, claiming that everyone got along. Mama's older sister, my great aunt Willa, described the good fortunes of our new homeland in her own transcribed oral history, saying segregation, as it was in the USA, was unthought of. 
But Daddy, my grandfather, spoke more carefully when reminiscing about Campsie, explaining that it wasn't like Amber Valley for black folks there. He insisted that it was Klan territory. He spoke of the tar and feathering of a man 160 miles south in Lacombe in 1930. He was very clear in cautioning us about traveling in the Canadian prairies alone. Daddy never elaborated much when delivering his warnings. He never talked about how local white citizens in Campsie barred the area's African-American children from getting an education. Daddy never talked about how one African-American mother in Campsie reputedly took her children to the local school only to find the doors locked against them, nor did he disclose that this discrimination went on for years. I imagine now that he was trying to spare us from the pain of knowing the things that he and mama knew, the ugliness and fear that was common for them. I want to make it clear that my grandparents weren't blind and they weren't fools. I suspect that all of my four family knew that Canada was not all that my that was not all what had been made out to be. But even if that were true, there was an opportunity a slim chance that this place could be willed into being a haven where every man was accepted on his merit or demerit, regardless of race, color, or creed. But it never was, and it wouldn't be. Inspection of the hard data shows that the environment wasn't exactly conducive to materializing the dream. My research into my family's history and migration points to a very different reality, and in the discrepancy, I look for deeper meaning in the few things they said, as well as the, as the things my kin's belie kin believed were better left unsaid. Despite the 1907 lynching of a black man in Henrietta, Oklahoma, and the 885 reported lynchings of African Americans in the USA between 1900 and 1910, and the knowledge that some black people in Okfiskey County were forced to leave their land by commercial clubs engaging in Ku Klux Klan type activities, no one in the family ever detailed why we left other than to say when Oklahoma became a state in 1907, things began getting worse for our people. Mama and Daddy never spoke of anti-black immigration policies that awaited our family as we attempted to enter Canada, or the letters sent to the government from crazed white Albertans that insisted when it was learned that these Negroes were coming out, there was a great indignation, and many threatened violence, threatened to meet them on the trail out of town and drive them back. Nor did my grandparents elaborate, elaborate on Great Aunt Willa's benign explanation that all of our household goods for a family of 14 were in a warehouse in Athabasca. The warehouse burned down. We could not prove the value of the articles, and as a result, they gave us $125. Now, even though we're talking about 1910, $125 for a family of 14 is nothing. But just, I want to flag that very quickly just to kind of create that connection to now. So by researching the Klan, I came to understand that Great Aunt Willa's reticent acknowledge, acknowledgement spoke loudly to the real life terror and lasting effect of the Klan's violent intimidation acts. I knew little of my great grandparents, who undoubtedly had, more, uh, had a more pronounced understanding of the Klan's activities. But I can speak to the ways that that repressed knowledge of the Klan affected my grandparents, uh, grandparents' psyche, and informed the way that they lived their lives and raised their children and grandchildren. The driving impetus behind uh, my solo exhibition, Invisible Empires, was a deep-seated suspicion that the fire my great Aunt Willa had mentioned was intentionally set by the Ku Klux Klan. When the project began in 2011, I had no idea whether or not my hunch was sound, nor did I know if I could satisfactorily substantiate such a claim in a public exhibition. It didn't help that I was working against current. Canada's black history is arguably built upon a foundation of no racism and no Klan claims. So the task of unsettling this deeply entrenched myth and then convincing a skeptical audience seemed incredibly daunting. But it was with an acquired appreciation and understanding of the nuances of what my kin had and had not said that led me to believe in the hunch. I wanted to manifest what I knew but could not immediately prove. 
time constraints limited my research goals, and while I could not definitively demonstrate a connection between the Athabasca warehouse fire and the Klan, I was able to recreate the environment in which the devastating fire occurred. One key reason that I couldn't link the Klan to the fire is that my family settled in Alberta 10 years before the fantastic Klansmen would cast their eyes upon Canada in the early 1920s. Alberta Human Rights Commissioner William Bergen, a very good friend of mine until he passed, uh, summarized that the Klan's Canadian infiltration, the, um, summarized the Klan's Canadian infiltration in his book, The Ku Klux Klan in Central Alberta, explaining uh, the circuitous, I hate saying that word, uh, route of the Klan from Indiana to Al Alberta took, its first, took it first to Montreal in 1921, then to Toronto, where it established national headquarters in 1924, and ultimately to Vancouver, where it settled in its imperial palace to keep British Columbia white. The last and most successful stop was Saskatchewan, where the organizational experience and political success gained by organizers there propelled them on to Alberta in 1929, but not before the Saskatchewan clan could boast 125 local chapters with over 40,000 members. So returning to my thesis, if a malicious group did burn down this warehouse, it would have more likely have been carried out by members of the Orange Lodge who shared a similar anti-Catholic and anti-foreigner agenda. Great Aunt Willa never spoke of the hostility that surrounded our family's migration to Amber, Amber Valley, but headlines from period newspapers such as the Edmonton Bulletin, the Calgary Herald, Regina Leader, and the Manitoba Free Press, uh, and articles such as Harold Troper's The Creek Negroes of Oklahoma and Canadian Immigration, 1909 to 1911, clearly detail the Dominion government's displeasure with the prospect of blacks or Creek Negroes from Oklahoma migrating to Canada. My great-grandparents my great -grandparents would arrive at the Canadian-US border crossing in Vancouver in 1910, around the same time that the Canadian Inspector of the United States and Immigration Agencies, W.J. White, advised Canada's Minister of the Interior, Frank Oliver, that it would be wise to say, take such action as would prevent any more blacks making homes in Canada. White's opinion that there is so much of the Indian blood in the colored man of Oklahoma carrying with him all the evil traits of a life of, of rapine and murder that it would not easily, they would not easily assimilate with agrarian life undoubtedly complemented the racist ideologies of his superior Oliver, whose newspaper, the Edmonton Bulletin, frequently ran inflammatory stories and anti-Negro rhetoric at the peak of the Creek Negro exodus. Echoing these sentiments in 1911, F.T. Fisher of the Edmonton Board of Trade anxiously conveyed his constituents' uneasiness in brewing local tensions about the prospect of Negro immigration. Writing to Oliver, Fisher stated, white settlers in the homestead districts are becoming alarmed and exasperated and are prepared to go to almost any length. People in the towns and cities are beginning to realize the imperative necessity of effective action, and it only need a slight effort to start up an agitation that would be joined in by practically every white man in the country. There is every indication that unless effective action is ta taken, such an agitation will be put in action in the near future. So evidence of this makes it hard to imagine a more opportunistic environment for a maliciously set fire. Of course, archived fire records from the city of Athabasca and local newspapers would further assist in my naming a culprit, but given the scenario, it would be unlikely that these records would cite blame if the arson was the work of angry whites. So invisible empires is a kind of a summary of things, uh, known but unknown, uh, a visual math, if you will, that reframes white authored narratives about lived black experiences in ways that cause the audience to draw very different conclusions about the century long history of the Ku Klux Klan uh, and anti-black discriminatory practices in Canada. Mounted at the Art Gallery of York University in Toronto in January 2013, the exhibition worked from an informed conclusion that the pre-Klan Orangemen are responsible for destruction of the destruction of my family's household belongings, and it was conceived to viscerally articulate what it's like to live in the shadow of the Klan. On a more personal note, the project is an homage to my uh, kin that reflects my indebtedness and commitment to my lineage. 
Invisible Empires is an effort to make amends. It is a means of witnessing unspoken horrors uh, and testifying for a class of people who were deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada by then Prime Minister Laurier in his August 12, 1911 order in council. Closer inspection of the Canadian government's file on the immigration of Creek Negroes discussed in Troper's essay brought me that much closer to confirming my initial suspicions. Troper wrote about the uneasy, uneasiness white Athabascans felt over the incipient invasion of black people. According to Troper, spokesmen from the Western business community reacted to the feared influx of blacks from Oakleth through local boards of trade. And at their monthly meetings, or at the, a monthly meeting in April 1910, the Edmonton Board of Trade urged that such immediate actions or immediate steps be taken by the Dominion government as will result in the Negro influx being stopped. Troper further described how an anti-Negro pr protest simmered most ardently in Edmonton, where in the spring of 1911, a petition was organized by the local Board of Trade demanding exclusion of black immigrants. Over 3,400 persons, including two who made their mark with an X, placed their name on the list. Many identified themselves as members of the Orange Lodge or Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire. Most of the gallery going public for Invisible Empires was not aware of my personal motivations, which is of no matter. Uh, the work is a public gesture that provided me with an opportunity to rethink my family's ways of being and reconsider the deeper spiritual, economic, and social political factors that caused our community to invest so heavily in visions of Canada as a, as a future refuge. The project allowed me to decipher the hidden truths buried within my family's stoic silences and now having co re compassionately recreated their past experiences, I'm better equipped to tell their story on their or our behalf. This project returns me to the words of Holocaust scholar and psychoanalysis uh, analysis, uh, Dory Laub, who eloquently explains that a new generation of innocent children removed enough from the experience are need needed to create meaningful remembrances that uncover and respeak difficult histories. By excavating and reanimating the traumatic histories that my family consciously and, un and unconsciously chose to repress, I am able to take guidance from their omissions, which itself reflects the writing of scholar Kathy Carruth, who speaks uh, to the reality of a history that in its crisis can only be perceived in, in unassimilable forms. This history may speak through the individual or through the community, which in its own suffering may not only be a site of its disruption, but the locus of a wisdom all its own. So that is the way that I want to set this up. So um, there's many kind of things going on in this body of work. Uh, again, uh, what I also should flag is that the project came together, Invisible Empires came together through uh, a residency. There's been many allies in doing this work. Um, Gallery 44 is a photographic center in Toronto, and they uh, commissioned a residency, a two-week residency, where I was able to workshop and create a lot of the works that ultimately went on to go into Invisible Empires. Um, the first is uh, this uh, experimental uh, film video that is building on an archived recording of an interview between a white reporter, Paul Good, who was stationed in the South during the peak of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and he, gave a, a, he had an interview with the highest ranking Klansman. Uh, wait, let me think about this. I gotta think, I'm getting my pieces mixed up. Uh, this particular recording is actually a recording of a school integration attempt in a little town called Nota Salga. Uh, and it's a docu effectively a recording that documents the integration attempt of six black students into a small town. Uh, and then also, by circumstance, it also documents the uh, discovery of a white reporter who was found on the bus with the black students uh, and then dragged off the bus, beaten, um, threatened uh, to be lynched, thrown in jail, took a photograph with the governor of the, of the state of Alabama, and then run out of town. But I use that as a bit of a kind of a pivot, which I'll speak to a little bit later. Another body of work that, again, is part of this exhibition. This is not the best image of it. But nonetheless, what these images are are uh, attempts to kind of start to bring the Canadian equation into this, this kind of investigation of the civil rights at, in the 60s. These are newspaper clippings 
on, in Canadian newspapers documenting or reporting on the Nota Selga school uh, integration attempt. What's really interesting is the ways in which the American, uh, the reports of the American race conflict is at the front of the newspaper, and the exact same kind of racial oppression against blacks in Canada is at the back of the newspaper. Um, again, so I had mentioned this beating. This is the, the, the three sole uh, images that correlate with that audio recording of the beating of this white reporter. The gentleman's name is Vernon Merritt III, and so these are images that are separate from uh, the audio recording. This is an entirely different archive. Um, and why I bring this forward, one, is to talk about the ways in which the media chose to take up this uh, particular integration attempt, because not because of the black students, not because of the, un the, the lack of justice in that scenario, but because a white reporter was beaten. That's why this became a national, uh, uh, national uh, report. Uh, that's why it became of national significance, one. The second thing that's really interesting to me is that uh, when I heard that report, the recording the first time, I assumed that, that was a, I was listening to the beating of a black man. And I then kind of slowly figured out that that was not the case. But I also uh, assumed that other people in hearing that re recording would assume uh, the same thing as I, that it was a black person being beaten, beaten. And that has become a kind of conceptual pivot for just about everything else I've done. So the other part of this body of work, um, another Paul Good recording. This is a, a durational performance piece that g goes with the rest of it. Uh, this is uh, an interview between Paul Good and the highest ranking Klansman in the United States, a gentleman named Robert Shelton. Uh, and effectively, this is 22 minutes of pure racism. Uh, but I was interested in it because I wanted to kind of look at the ways in which um, what happens when you look at an archival recording of something or, or you look at something historical? Uh, there's a difference between looking at a black and white on the screen or listening to a recording of it versus hearing the words uh, out loud. And so what we did with that recording is transcribe the interview word for word and then performed it daily. Um, I hired an actor um, uh, whose name is completely uh, Russell Bennett. Uh, who performed as the Klansman in this iteration, and then I performed as Paul Good. We uh, recorded that on time-lapse photography uh, and on video, and then every, so it became this kind of process of going from archive to present tense and then archive again uh, when those images were ultimately installed on the wall as we went through. The rest of the staging was left in place so you could read the script when we weren't there. The idea was that all of this material is available for you to inspect. Uh, you don't get recorded uh, in the way that we did, but it was just really crucial uh, to kind of leave behind the artifacts that uh, speak to the fact that this uh, archival material has been witnessed. Another part of this project, so I'm sometimes blurring between uh, reproductions of things and then the actual uh, images or objects themselves. This, this is, um, this is a original uh, editorial that went in the Saturday Evening Post around the same time as the school integration attempt. And what was crucial, it's a five page, or sorry, a 10 page spread, and those were all framed and available um, for uh, gallery goers to look at. Um, what was interesting to me about this was, again, this difference between who has access and privilege and safety uh, in these circumstances. And so the Klan had let uh, two white reporters and a white photographer into a cross-burning ceremony. And so the editorial effectively unpacks all of the rituals that go into that. And so all of that was made public, uh, literally borrowing from their headline where they insist that the Klan has nothing to hide. So I'm pushing that envelope that much more and publishing that material in the gallery space. And again, I'm trying to kind of work against some of the things that were going on in the uh, recording about the school integration attempt. Uh, the mayor of Nota Salga insists that there is no blockage in the school integration, though if you go into other newspaper reports, you come to realize that some 20, or sorry, some 200 uh, rednecks of various iterations are actually blocking these six students. And at the same time, you have things like these. Uh, this is a Klan rally that would have been six months plus or minus uh, around that integration attempt. And again, it just kind of undoes this idea that the school integration uh, went forward without any obstacles. There's also one other thing I want to flag about this is the key decision. Like this uh, in real life uh, from a 
artistic perspective, conceptual perspective, I really had to work through some, some things that were my issues around this particular image. Um, the original document um, is maybe five by nine inches, and I made a decision to um, enlarge this, and I had great anxiety about doing that. Uh, thinking about the implications of, of what that means as uh, a reproduction, what does it mean to enlarge something, what does it mean to reduce the scale of something. All of those things are factors that I definitely sweated through in the making of all of this work. So those works all kind of fed into Invisible Empires um, and then also went into uh, the greater exhibition that start, went into this phase. And this, is a different body of work. This is, try this is like a, a bridge between that first section and a middle that's trying to kind of place the Canadian perspective about the clan into the equation. Um, most specifically, what I'm trying to get at is the ways in which Canadians constantly deflect notions of the clan being in Canada. Um, and just their general response to racism overall uh, with and, and pointing to Americans as the kind of the, the marker of what racism is and everything else pales in comparison for whatever reason. Um, so this is, there's many things going on in this particular piece, but what this is, is this is a set shot, Michelle Clark, I'm finally gonna get that right, I finally did that, thank you. Uh, Michelle Clark took the photograph of this. This is a behind the scenes shot of a um, shot for shot reproduction or recreation of an interview that the CBC um, had done in the Toronto studios in 1965, again, around the same time as the school integration attempt. Um, and this is, it's a bit of a setup. This is, uh, uh, who is this? Calvin Craig, who is the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Georgia. He is a protege of Robert Shelton, who is the gentleman I talk about in the other piece. Uh, and then the other guy is uh, George uh, Sly, who is his sidekick, um, Klan muscle uh, in, other, in other texts. Uh, and on the other side is uh, Wes, Will Wes Williams, Maestro Fresh West, who's performing as James Bevel, Reverend James Bevel, who was the second, uh, se second most powerful civil rights activist to Martin Luther King, depending on who you talk to. Um, but he's responsible for integrating or, or starting to bring forward children or black or the school integration attempts into the civil rights movement overall. So this gentleman is responsible for that. And in the middle there, uh, is Robert Hoyt who's, the, Hoyt, who is the CBC host. And what I was interested in, though it looks like I'm focused on the Klan, and I am, uh, I'm really interested in Robert Hoyt, who, can, who sets up both parties. He doesn't tell the Klansmen uh, that, they, that he's invited the civil rights activists, and the civil rights activists has come uh, slightly terrified, but has come on the stage in this live interview, and they have this really, really intense exchange that probably would have ended very differently if, that was a if it was a back alley. So I thought it was a very interesting thing to kind of recreate. I also thought it was an interesting thing to consider the difference between the black and white archival uh, recording of this and then turning it into color, one. Uh, so we did that and it made things just a little bit more present. You don't have that kind of buffer that happens between archival material. Uh, and then we also performed it live on opening night, um, one time only. Uh, and the, uh, the difference between watching the recreated video and then watching that live performance and the ways that those words, the words that these gentlemen were saying, how electrified uh, they were and how it deeply affected the people that actually attended the event. So after the, pub, the, the opening night, uh, the stage stays in place and there's this kind of thing that I'm thinking through around uh, the presence or the, uh, there's something about absence in all of this uh, and specifically it's about this idea of the clan being seen and then being gone and then the ways in which the memory of their presence hovers over a space. And so what I did here is I chose to, this is the, C, uh, recreate the, the set that we created that is a reproduction of the CBC set. Um, it is by fluke in some ways, uh, an exact replica of the set itself. And so after the performance, after we shot the video, we left the stage in place as a kind of relic to uh, uh, an exchange that took place. Uh, and then the video itself plays on that monitor uh, just right to the screen, or right to the stage. Also, um, 
After that, after the performances, the clan robes were taken off and presented as art objects. Now, if you're traveling in the South, um, it's fairly, it, it happens fairly often, these kind of restaging of clan ephemera. It's not as loaded as it is in the North. So uh, I, it might kind of read in a very, in a particular way, it might be troublesome for you, but certainly uh, I borrow from the ways in which Southerners kind of embrace this history. So I am bringing these forward as art objects, very purposefully trying to present them as well-crafted things as the originals were. Um, and what does it mean for, for me to produce that? I think that there's at least one other artist I know in the international art world that's kind of presented clan robes as art object, but what does it mean for a black woman to present them as art objects? Uh, and then what does it mean effectively for all of this material to be in a gallery space, uh, predominantly white gallery space? So. Uh, so there's that piece, and then also uh, the way that those clansmen or the mannequins are situated is they basically are looking over your shoulder as you're watching the video uh, in front of the stage. So again, I'm trying to set up this kind of feeling of the clan overshadowing everything that you do. Uh, just behind that is a, um, I call it a clan heaven. It wasn't necessarily that, but it is, it is um, life size. Uh, and what it is, is it effectively is some, uh, another clansman's version uh, of, clan, of, the, of a clan heaven that he drew when uh, Calvin Craig was anointed or appointed to uh, Grand Dragon. So it effectively is, and it uh, illustrates uh, all of the clan values, uh, God, uh, bearing arms, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff is all kind of pictorially laid out in that image. Again, what I was interested here was what happens if you take something repellent and you package it as sexy, glossy as you possibly could. So that is the prettiest light box I have ever made. And I did it on purpose because I really wanted to kind of push against uh, the kind of guttural response of, of repulsion, right? And then in the far back, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but in the far back is a clode card, which is a hymn, literally a, a clan-based uh, religious hymn, so to speak. Uh, and that is a, an enlarged reproduction of an object that I bought on eBay. Um, again, trying to kind of pay homage to my grandfather. These are uh, the following couple of images are at the very least are places that I have been or my grandfather has been. This is uh, the imperial, uh, what is it? The imperial uh, headquarters uh, in Vancouver in Shaughnessy in British Columbia in 1926. Uh, again, uh, working against the notion that the Klan does not exist, hasn't existed in Canada, all of those things. Uh, this is uh, absolutely irrefutable. And again, it speaks to the, uh, an understanding of Vancouver, the city, uh, in ways that uh, I don't know, but certainly my grandfather does. And then these two, uh, again, trying to situate the clan in Canada, again, uh, and this is a very, very quick mapping of the history of the Orange Lodge and then into the Ku Klux Klan in the 80s. So on the left is the oldest Orange Hall or the Orange Order Lodge in Edmonton. It dates back to 1898, and that gives you the first bookmark. And on the right-hand side is the last known site of a Ku Klux Klan uh, Clavern uh, in Ontario, and that's just outside of Etobicoke, I believe. Um, the building is not uh, the original. The site is the building, of course, was torn down uh, in the middle 1980s. But that is not to say that there aren't st um, clan havens that are still in existence. There certainly is one on Carleton, just, what is that, east of Church? Uh, I think there's one other kind of building that's still in existence in the city. But again, backtracking to and trying to make connections to Canada. Um, this is a reproduction of the petition that I had men mentioned in its entirety. Um, I happened, when I found the petition, I was in uh, Ottawa at the National Gallery and there happened to be an Arno Mag uh, Mag's exhibition up, and so I was just really struck by the uh, order and a rigid kind of pr presentation of images that he was doing, and I bar admittedly very purposefully borrowed from his practice in order to sit, such, um, set up this petition. Um, 
I wanted you or any person that came into the gallery space to be able to see the handwriting on this. I wanted you to be able to read the street names. I wanted you to be able to see, to dig around and kind of um, really come to terms with the scope of hate, really. Um, it's one thing to kind of hear about a petition. It's one thing to hear that it's 20% of, of the population of a city, but it is another thing to really kind of get a handle on the physicality of what was produced and what was sent to the government. Um, on the bench in front, there is a hard copy, because uh, I couldn't figure out how to bring this into the gallery space. This is a, a hard copy of the correspondence between the Edmonton Board of Trade or the, out, the various uh, boards of trade that uh, put this petition together and the Canadian government. This is when I go out on a limb and say that the Canadian government actively recruited the Ku Klux Klan into the country to, de to uh, deter the immigration of blacks coming from Oklahoma. Um, why I say that is largely because every single facet of this petition is produced in consultation with the government and then tucked in between these pages, not only is the petition itself, but there are these curious pledges by um, individuals who have a very purposeful kind of agenda of uh, protecting and upholding the values of the then king uh, and the monarchy and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but where I'm going with this is this idea that um, you can't possibly kind of produce this kind of hate material with a government and not expect it to have some kind of a direct link. It, particu uh, it particularly kind of plays out when you know that the Minister of the Interior is also disseminating anti-black uh, you know, anti sentiment through his own newspaper. There is no... Um, kind of law or rules around conflict of interest or any of those things. These are all hate sentiments that are coming directly from the Canadian government and going right out into the public. And it has a very real effect. Last thing I want to talk about, because this material is all heavy. I wish Jason Ebanks was here, because he, I, anyhow, um, it's a lovely gentleman. Um, this last piece is the last way that I interpreted this material. The whole exhibition in its entirety is heavy, admittedly heavy. Uh, people were triggered. Uh, people didn't know what to do with this material. Again, this is like th almost three years ago now. So um, this was a shock to the senses. And I wanted to give people a way uh, something to do with this. What, what do you do with this? I didn't want to kind of lay, dump this on you and then have you go out in the world and be fucked up and then not be able to do anything, right? So what I did, this last piece, is I, uh, the AGYU, York University has a shuttle bus from downtown campus going up to York University that basically takes gallery goers uh, to and from the gallery space. And what I chose to do is I try, and again, borrowing from the civil rights movement, I chose to uh, work in collaboration with three activist artists, uh, Rena Katz, uh, Archer Pachawis, and Shelley Hamilton. Um, and Shelley Hamilton happens to be from the old black families in uh, Africville. And she's also a spiritual, she's a gospel singer. And so I hired her to teach people the history of freedom songs, the civil rights freedom songs on the way up to the gallery space. Uh, everybody got a little handout and they gave you the lyrics and all that kind of stuff. And Shelley, Shelley broke down the meanings of the particular songs that she taught. And then throughout the course of the exhibition, while we were at the gallery space, we just kind of did what they did in the 60s. And we just murmured to people, get on the bus, make sure to get on the bus. And we never told people exactly what we were trying to do, but we just kept saying, get on the bus. And so there was a selection of people that were able to get on the bus. And on the way home, people understood why they sang freedom songs. And they did the whole way home. And they were dropped off in front of the Harlem restaurant uh, in order. Well, the idea was that, you know, again, it would be this next kind of segue of taking you into real life. Now that you've figured out the meaning behind these freedom songs, now that you've understood that there's these uh, bus riders have come to understand how you can go from sorrow into song, the idea was that these people would go out in the world and make some kind of greater change. They had been uh, educated to a particular history that they did not know about. And the idea was that I was trying to create uh, allies as best that I possibly could. So that is 
a very truncated version of Invisible Empires. That show uh, was 2013 that I went on to present an iteration of uh, another iteration of the Paul Good performances in Atlanta, 10 minutes away from actual uh, Klan activist conflict. Uh, so that was 2013. And in 2015, I also went to, uh, I had a show in Philadelphia and represented the Paul Good performance again, but this time I performed as the Klansman. I performed as Robert, Sh Robert Shelton, and I worked with students at the University of Pennsylvania, and they performed as Paul Good. Uh, and what was interesting about that was the, it, the opportunity that I had to segue from this kind of digging in the muck kind of archival work uh, and try and kind of make some connection to what's happening in the world. The Philadelphia exhibition happened at the same time that Ferguson was erupting. And so what I did is I chose to kind of borrow from that, so to speak, uh, and try to create some kind of connection between the ways in which uh, black revolt gets told in the media. Uh, more often than not, it's presented in this way of, you know, black people going crazy. We just don't know how that happened. Um, so going from that to a more informed understanding that the Klan uh, or Klan-like organizations agitate from the back end, and that spurs revolt. Uh, in the case of Ferguson, in the case of, well, more specifically, Philadelphia, there are 150 years of white terrorism of, uh, and anti-black terrorism in that state, specifically in the city of Philadelphia, that directly resulted in its own race riots in the 1960s. And in my mind, uh, that, arc, that particular model, that mapping between 150 years of, of white terrorism and black revolt, that is uh, a model that you could apply to Ferguson. You could apply it to just about anything that is going on in the United States at this time. And as a way of kind of sharing this information, um, I had collaged that 150 years worth of history into um, catalog pages that were put out and made free uh, to gallery goers. Again, the logic here is that I'm trying to share as much of this information as possible. Uh, the connections between history and the present day um, are very real, and the work I try to produce is all revolving around kind of bringing that to the fore. So. I'm going to stop with that, but I will flag a couple of things. If uh, you are interested in checking out the more contemporary works that I've produced, you can find it at that website, dianabowen.ca. Photo credits, of course, are there. And then the title of uh, the book that this particular chapter will be in, the extended version of this chapter, uh, will be in Charmaine Nelson's Toward an African-Canadian Art History, Art, Memory, and Resistance. And that will come out uh, later next year. And that is all. So one thing I was kind of charged to do, um, and what I was trying to get at with all of this was I was trying to make a connection between a few things that are going on in the world right now. Um, first and foremost, I want to flag, did you want to oh, go? Sorry, I'm sorry, Look, I forgot. Come on up, come on up. Come on up. Do you want to start it? Sure. OK, okay. Go, go, go. Just sorry. give a round of applause one more time for Deanna. Thank you so much. For that. <laughs> OK, so basically, um, there's a mic here. If you all have any questions, um, feel free to ask Deanna whatever you have in mind. Um, I, well, I can start it off. Um, uh, thank you again for giving the presentation. Okay. I guess my first question would be, um, how, like, I know you mentioned like triggering, but how was it for you personally, like tying in these stories of like the KKK narrative um, in Canada yeah. and bringing that to your own personal story and how it's impacted you and like how you've grown and been able to understand it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I can, I'm on a mic, so I can do this. I can stand anywhere. <laughs> um, uh, the Klan, the knowledge of the Klan and its presence in Canada has always been in my world. Like I said, my grandfather kind of raised me to. Uh, to look out for them, but then it, the more that I've researched it, the more that things that I didn't necessarily connect, things that I had kind of attached to family dysfunction became much clearer, connect, more, more clearly connected to anti-black violence. So by example, um, my 
uh, grandfather kept three rifles in his house until he died in 1994. Now, he's a farmer, admittedly, you know, so on the farm that would make perfect sense, but we moved from the farm in the 1950s. So the need for these three rifles didn't quite make any sense, uh, you know, uh, for me growing up. It didn't make any sense that every damn family brawl we had, those rifles came out, you know, like the shotgun on the front lawn. Like, really? Really? You know, <laughs> like, um, so I didn't make those connections between those things. And the way that family talked back in the day, we never called it racism. We never called them the clan. We called them many other names, but we never called them the things that I've come to learn to apply. Um, so it was, it has been, um, it continues to be deeply affirming to make the connections between uh, what I've researched and discovered and the ways in which I used to view my family, the ways that I've come to embrace and love the way that my family is. Um, so if I were to go all the way back to my, the beginnings of my artistic practice, the first 10 years of my practice, I tried desperately not to include a black body. I didn't want to talk about my family. I didn't want to go there. I couldn't wrap my head around them. And then I finally kind of ran out of places to go and ended up kind of embracing blackness ultimately. So the last, you know, the last 10, 15 years has been that. Um, but when I started talking about my family, when I began doing this work, I had a I mean, just an enormous amount of conflict uh, about how we were. Uh, my memories, uh, and, uh, and I have to set this up again because we were one of a few uh, black families in Vancouver in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, few, very few. Uh, and those black, community, those black families that were there scrapped amongst themselves. They scrapped with everybody. I mean, it was just like a really messy time. Um, it, the laws were different. Everything was very different, right? So um, doing the research has enabled me to kind of come to a better understanding of who these people were. There's a, in the 1980s, there was a family brawl that turned into a, it was a nightclub flight fight, as I understood it, that was somebody stepping on somebody's shoes. That's how it was told to me. But going back and doing the research, what it was was actually a white bouncer that beat one of my relatives, which turned into a street ball, which turned into family coming from home and bringing baseball bats. And it turned into a blocking of the street. It turned into one of my uncles being profoundly beaten by the police uh, and ultimately reaching a settlement with the city. It turned into a major court case with then uh, MLA, Rosemary Brown, and the civic leaders at that time defending our family. And these were all things that I didn't quite understand. Uh, but the research has kind of brought it around, and I understand what it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, that was a very long question, or a very long answer. Sorry, but I probably just gave you my whole life story now. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I have to kind of flag that it is somewhat important for me to do that because I don't want this to seem like this is some kind of arbitrary um, and abstract scenario. This is really rooted in the everyday, um, all of our everydays, and, and more specifically, I wa what I wanted to do, and I think I unpacked this at the beginning, I wanted to talk about three things. I wanted to talk about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. I wanted to talk about truth and reconciliation report. I wanted to talk about the Syrian refugees that are coming into the country and the way that they're getting pushed back, and I also wanted to talk about uh, the shooting in Minneapolis. All of these things, I can see direct connections between what I just read for you, the work that I just presented to you, and what's happening in the world. So um, I guess I speak very personally because I'm trying to open a door for you to imagine a way to talk about what's going on in the world as well. Um, I did bring some links, and I don't know if, we can, if you want me to do that. Um, that kind of highlight a few things. So obviously, the Paris attacks. Um, I don't even know what the correct way to kind of term that. But anyhow, um, the attacks in Paris. Uh, what I think I find is really interesting is uh, the ways in which the media is not speaking about things like this, the nine hate crimes by white terrorists uh, since the Paris attacks. Um, Manfo, I'm not going to kind of read this off word for word, but one thing that I think is particularly interesting is this one, the mosque uh, that was set on fire in Peterborough. 
Now, again, I my research was rooted in un, 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 what, unva un, unveiling a connection between a warehouse fire and the Klan for, as it related to my family. And I can't help but look at this fire and obviously make similar connections. Um, what I wanted to do when I was talking about a workshop about this was to do, to put it out to the audience. Um, and actually, I should do this before I kind of dig into this much, much more. Um, I wanted uh, all of you to kind of think about this and then a couple of other things, and then also think about positive things, a counter uh, counterculture kind of responses to these things. I think about the mosque, and then I think about the 100,000 100, that was raised in a week that, uh, that was uh, raised by people that were in support of this community, right? So I mean, there's some kind of really positive things that come out of these things also that don't get reported enough. Um, that's the first part, but I have to back up. I, I kind of got ahead of myself, because what I wanted to do was just by a show of hand, just to kind of situate us all in this conversation. Um, how many of you in this room, now I know that I am fifth generation in my family lineage to have lived in Canada, uh, but I am third to be you know, raised or born here. I wasn't born here, but I was raised here. How many of you have been, are what, let's say, uh, fifth generation in Canada? By a show of hands. One, two, three, four, four. Fourth generation? So what's that going back to your grandparents, great grandparents? Great grandparents? Third generation. Second? So that's what your parents, your grandparents, parents, depending on who it is? First generation? Nice. Aboriginal? Ooh. Silence. Ooh. Okay. Ish. Ish. Okay. So what was interesting about that for me is none of us are old stock Canadians, as Stephen Harper would like us <laughs> to believe, right? So it just kind of, you know, it sets up this realization that we all came from somewhere, somewhere else at some point or another. So the connections between the people that we're talking about here, Syrians that want to come into this, into this country, uh, and the ways that we push back for a variety of reasons. My mom has some whack ideas, um, as, by example. Um, <laughs> Uh, as though she's been here from like the beginning or something. So <laughs> I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. So I just wanted to kind of flag that. Um, and then I, what other, I wanted to talk about, uh, there was a Toronto woman picking up her kids who was assaulted uh, by two white men. Uh, I mean, woman's just going to get her kids at school, right? And gets attacked, right? You've already got, like, you've got a school trustee in Toronto that actually is putting out uh, defense courses for Muslim women within a week, right? It's crazy, right? Um, so I wanted to flag that. I wanted to flag, let me go here, this, which I think is fascinating. So if a bunch of black people went and parked in front of a church with a bunch of semis, semis or semi-automatics or rifles or what have you, and just camped out because they wanted to show a threat or, or to put some kind of harmful presence, you know how that would go, right? But these guys in Texas are out there with like full military kind of gear in front of a mosque with the sole purpose of terrorizing the people in the mosque and they don't get arrested. The cops don't come, reporters come, they tell you point blank what they're doing and everything's cool. And I just find that to be a really fascinating thing. And how does that happen? Um, and then one other thing, I wanted to go back to this. Uh, our friend Stephen Harper and his uh, rejection of the indigenous rights um, document that came out of the UN, uh, refusal to investigate the thousands of murdered and, and missing indigenous women, and what does that speak to? Uh, and then also the truth and reconciliation reports that clearly illustrate that there's a, you know, a century long history of brutality against the indigenous community and nothing happens. Nothing happens to these things, right? So I'm just kind of, I'm, um, messed up a little bit about it for the ways that, you know, the, the presentation that I gave you was, uh -huh, well, 1900s, and we're here. And there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Uh, and then bringing it to Toronto and blackness. 
Desmond Cole's report of being carded 50 times because he's black. I mean, obviously this report goes on uh, a little bit longer, but what I'm interested in is the historical precedent that uh, slavery pr uh, brings forward. The fact that carding is something that comes after or it borrows from uh, passes that freed blacks or freed slaves have when they left the plantation, and how close is that to this? or not, or is or not, whichever way you want to look at that. And so that I find to be like an incredible uh, um, a horror to consider. Um, at the, the conflation is kind of, it's just terrifying when I, when I think about it far too much. And then again, going to Minneapolis, this is last night, again, uh, how does this happen that these guys aren't caught before the shooting in front of a police station? How does that happen that white men can show up with uh, guns and shoot black protesters, you know, peaceful protesters in front of a police station? How does that happen, right? I mean, now I've investigated the Klan long enough to know that the Klan infiltrates the police, so, you know, there's that. Right, but it blows my mind that this can happen. Right, it's just I, I find it amazing stuff. So, those are the things that I wanted to bring forward for you to consider. I don't want to kind of go on and preach much longer than this. I actually, what I want is I would love to have your feedback about how you read this. Where are you in all of this material? Um, do you have a perspective or an opinion about any of this? Yeah, it's, it's complicated because before they got here, we were, we were black Indians before we got here, right? Um, and that gets complicated because we were part of the Cherokee Nation and the Creek Nation, which were slaveholding uh, nations. So that kind of intermingling of blood is a blessing and a curse on either side. Um, but when they came to Canada, it was a blessing. My grandfather, my great great grandfather, uh, could actually work with the indigenous communities in Fort McMurray because he could speak the language. So there was a connection there, for real. Uh, there was also a connection between the Eastern Europeans that differently oppressed Eastern Europeans that had settled in Canada around the same time. These were not the preferred Europeans like the British, but these were like uh, the Ukrainians or, in some circumstances, the Germans. Um, there were a whole bunch of other kind of Eastern European communities that we did find alliances with. And then there were American Christ white American Christians, uh, different agendas. But those were the alliances that we had. Um, some of them were good alliances. I have my own opinion about the Christian thing. Um, and that particular pocket of Christians uh, is tr problematic in many kind of ways. But nonetheless, it still was a refuge of sorts. So when my family talks about, you know, everybody got along. What they're talking about is that pocket of Christians that they, that they really kind of only associated with. Yeah? Anyone else? Beat you guys down. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So I know, like, the class um, recently, like, read an article about, like, white privilege. Yeah. And I want to ask you all, how do you think that plays out when you see the videos that these guys are able to, like, go and camp at this mosque? and not actually get arrested for carrying these guns with them. Like, how do you guys see that playing out with like, privilege? Y'all just talked about this class. Melissa, what were you going to say? Um, it was really a sort of a question about archive and memory. Yeah. So the one, there was one thing I do want to say, just in terms of positivity. I am not a person of faith, but my aunt is. She belongs to a very small church in Jerome, Quebec. Yeah. And um, I was at her place um, during the summer, and there was a copy of the 94 recommendations on her on her table. And I was like, where'd you get this, Auntie? And she was like, oh, they gave it out in church. We're going to be talking about it. Wow. Um, and, and then I was like, hey, you know, we should talk about it. She's like, we'll do it at Christmas. So, <laughs> in Winters, are you this I don't want to be at your place at Christmas. At, um, um, at, uh, over the holidays. I'll let you know if I survive. OK, so, yeah. Um, but my question. Record it. <laughs> but no, but just in terms of positive, I was shocked. Yeah. Like, I was shocked she's a member of, like, a small United Church, and yeah. this was something that they have devoted time to. Yeah. Um, 
but so my question is about um, archive, mm -hmm. um, and so ar and archive and memory, right? Mm -hmm. So if you'll allow me the analogy, when I um, I have like 8,500 unmet messages on Google, right? Mm -hmm. And when I archive something, it goes away. Like mm -hmm. It just goes, mm -hmm. it gets filed, mm -hmm. right? And I don't see it unless I know what to look for. Exactly. Right? Like I got to type yeah. in like the right sender or the right phrase, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So for me, like, so the question in terms of, for, from me to you with regards to archive and archival research is how does one know what right. to look for? How does one then privilege memory? Do you, yeah. Do you, yeah, 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 I follow where you're going. I follow where you're going. Um, some of it's fluke. Uh, I have to be really honest. I. Uh, one of my key research strategies is to find a book and then go through the bibliography of that book and then backtrack and find everything that they that particular author has cited and then from there it usually tends to go the way of uh, digging in one archive and ultimately finding something else by accident uh, so it's not like i know where i'm going by any stretch of the imagination now having said that um uh, how do i kind of uh, People uh, are a factor in how I access the archive as well. I've had one, two, three, four really great and odd circumstances where it's been librarians who know the archive extensively who ultimately tip me off to something. Or be, you know, I kind of, you know, I can play dumb like anybody else. And certainly at the, at the National Archive, I played real dumb. And I befriended a really great archivist who, was, who actually knew about this file. Because this is a perfect example of, you know, you archive and it disappears. This file on the Creek Negro immigration into Canada was, I'm not going to say it was purposefully buried, but it was way the hell back there. Way the hell back there. And the only reason I was able to find it is because I was cute with the librarian. <laughs> but that's really what it is, right? And, and just continue to be cute until I got all of the information that I needed, and that was that, right? Um, Sometimes it's a disgruntled librarian. The, the librarian in the reference library, at, uh, Toronto's reference library, in the basement in the newspaper section, I happened to come across him when he just got transferred and he was pissed. And so he unpacked a whole bunch in the archive for me. Uh, Atlanta was a different librarian who it took me a number of weeks uh, to actually get what I wanted because she was convinced that I couldn't handle what I was looking for. Uh, so there's those kind of things to consider as well. Um, so there are those kind of things that mess with memory. Those are real life people that mess with memory, right? Aside from things getting lost. Um, but then beyond that, there's also other things like uh, information comes to you when you're ready. And so I can speak on every facet of my research journey. Uh, there has been stuff that I just could not get for whatever reason. I couldn't find it, couldn't figure it out, couldn't whatever. Um, and then I just, as I kind of work around, do other things and dig in other places. And then when I'm ready, that other archive kind of shows itself. Uh, and then I just kind of dig into that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm thinking of the image of, you know, sort of they're reading through the recommendations at the official launch, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. then, you know, when we get to the recommendation, I, I cannot remember which one it is, but calling for, um, for a national inquiry. Yep. And we have the minister who sits while everyone else stands up mm -hmm. and, and claps. Yep. And again, I want to sort of ask the question with regards to archiving as well, yep. right? Like sort of thinking of the 94 recommendations, yep. right? as a piece of history that, again, is going to get filed. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we, we acknowledge it exists. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, we don't acknowledge it exists. We acknowledge it, it exists in the writing, but we bury it, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very clear, right, through the sitting of the minister that this is going to be buried. Yeah. And only those, like my aunt and her lady friend, yeah. right, go to look for it, yeah. right? And so, again, what do, so then my question becomes, what do you see the role of art and artists right, mm. in, in that whole, it happened, but it didn't happen because yeah. we never talked about it? Yeah. Um, I keep thinking that the internet is a huge, huge, huge factor in all of this. Um, 
Now, it's not to say that the internet's going to solve the problem, but I know that the report came out, but I also know that a lot of people published that report on the internet. So even if the physical report gets buried, in my mind, there's got to be at least one or two of those links that'll stay, stay current for a period of time, long enough for some people to download it and have it. That's not going to guarantee that everybody has access, but at least some of those will exist. And if those links don't exist, if those documents don't exist on the internet, then at least there'll be some kind of searchable history online uh, for, uh, as far as the existence of the document itself. There'll be reports about that document in some way or another. You may not be able to find the, the material itself, but you may be able to find reports that speak to where it is or where it was. And a lot of the archival research work after that is literally trying to, is backtracking to where it was last known and then trying to figure out where it traveled to, right? Um, uh, an example that's not related to truth and reconciliation, but certainly is related to the Klan's history in Philadelphia. Um, the Klan, I could find all the way into the 1930s, and then I couldn't figure out, I couldn't find anything in the 1940s. And just by fluke, and this kind of sets up what I was talking about earlier, um, I ended up researching something else and ended up in the, uh, in the uh, police records and found that the Klan records for 1940 to 1950 were all in police archives because they are one and the same, right? And that's how something like that gets buried, is because who the hell would think to look for the Klan in the police archives, right? But that's exactly how that was, right? So, and how that came about was literally uh, backtracking, a bit of backtracking, a bit of lost, a bit of fluke, a bit of all those things. Um, what do artists do? I'm a really, I, well, I say this from the perspective of somebody who is very conscious of the fact that I can say what I want without going to jail. Uh, I can protest for the most part, certainly on Canadian soil, I can say a shitload of stuff and not go to jail, not get arrested, not get beaten as a black person who's speaking against the state, right? So I, um, and I'm also conscious of the fact that I'm, you know, the first in my family to have a university education. I have access to the institution. I got a shitload of privilege and I make use of it by, by uh, producing works that disseminate information. Um, so my work tends to look like it's bibliographic. It's a bit dry. It looks like a whole bunch of documents that have gone out in the world, but I do it on purpose because it's a mean of, means of publishing that doesn't require that I have to vet my paper by, by any committee. I don't have to wait for a publication cycle. I don't have to do any of that stuff. You know, if you kind of break it down to even its most basic level, anyone in this room could, can, can create a website and disseminate whatever the hell they want anything, right? So if you all dug up something, your family history, somebody else's family history, um, a racist asshole that's down the street and you just want people to know, I mean, you all could create that website and disseminate that information. I mean, I, I am just so incredibly struck by the amount of privilege as far as publishing goes, the ability to write and put things out in the world that this generation has versus my mother certainly couldn't do this. My grandparents definitely could not do this, but we can. And you know, we can fire off an email or go onto Facebook or whatever it is and uh, disseminate all kinds of material. So there's that. Um, you know, we also <coughs> have cell phones with cameras. We all, um, even though I teach video, I have a particular aesthetic around video, but I also embrace the fact that you can produce any number, uh, any kind of uh, video work that puts another kind of documentation out in the world, right? Um, it's not that, it's not, in my mind, it's not that we have not, that we don't or we can't uh, put this material out, it's just that we don't, you know what I mean? It, it's, this is, the way that I'm kind of thinking about your question is more, uh, for me, it's more about a conversation of will than it is necessarily about access or means or anything. It's just about a desire to, um, I guess, cross the line or, or make that move or take a risk and kind of stand behind a political perspective and do something about it, right? Not kind of, you know, um, arbitrarily or conceptually, abstractly kind of think about something, but actually to do something, you know? Does that answer? Yeah? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Did you feel like in danger? Were you really scared? Were there any people checking for you? Um, 
no, I did some stupid shit when I was traveling in the South. I did, right. but, 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 that, but that was really more of a reflection of my doing stupid shit. It wasn't that I, it wasn't like I was doing something and people decided that, you know, we're going to get here. I never, yeah. I never got that. Now, in Selma, Selma, ironically enough, is a you know, major civil rights town, but it is also a Klan town. I was protected by locals uh, who kind of kept me out of trouble for the most part. Um, I don't know what it would be. I, I have to be very honest. I don't know what it had, would, would it have been like if I didn't know them. Right. Um, so my understanding of Alabama, my time in Alabama was uh, very safe. Um, it might have been very. I look back at it now and I go, "Damn, that could have gone really, really wrong." But I was okay. Um, I won't lie. This make this work makes me paranoid. Um, uh, I, I would be, I've, I'm well researched enough to know that the clan is out there and is, is paying attention. Um, there are days where I think, oh, I'm just this chick in Toronto, nobody knows about me, and that might be true. Um, and then there are other days when I'm not so sure. Um, also, because, you know, I'm well researched enough to know that they're out there, right? So it's a bit of a catch 22, you know? Um, and I can't spend a lot of time thinking about it because if I do, I won't do this. Um, which you could apply to anything, yeah. right? Any kind of protest, any kind of engagement. If you think about what, how you will get hurt, you won't move. So um, I've made this work really, really, really personal. This is about my grandparents and my great grandparents, and this is about my family, and I keep it in that place and root it in this desire to be truthful and honor their lives. And so it makes the work easier. I have a healthy relationship to gin. I like gin and tonics. They help me in this work. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in all sincerity. I mean, because the work is difficult, right? But there have been, I'm on a high moment right now with this work. There have been lows, for sure. Um, but it's the family piece that keeps me in it. Um, if we were having this conversation maybe two years ago, three years ago, I probably would have been less optimistic. Um, the push back locally uh, was hard uh, to handle. And it, you know, it's understandable, but it was still a pushback that gave me stress, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't feel so scared, but I have been thinking about going to teach in the States and from a social practice perspective, and I get kind of nervous because Donald Trump's posse ain't playing, and they literally just beat a Black Lives Matter a protester, what, two days ago, three days ago? They're really not playing. And so um, I have to acknowledge that I am doing this work in Toronto. And there is a hell of a lot of safety in doing it in Toronto. But to take it to the States kind of freaks me out. Um, but it's necessary work. So I probably will do it if it comes to that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, has your family seen or saw your <laughs> exhibition? And, you know, if so, like in that aftermath, mm. have there been any kind of news stories that have come up? Because I know, you know, from the perspective of elders, sometimes they don't want to tell you the yeah. story because they want to try and, you know, keep you and kind of save you from the trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, my mom, she hasn't seen the show. She knows about the show. Um, who has seen it in my family? I've told a few family members, and they got quiet, and I haven't seen them in a long time. <laughs> um, and actually, Clayton, the, the little guy that was at the beginning, is grown now and has a family and, and asked me about my work with his three sons. And I told him very openly about what I am doing, and I haven't heard from them in a couple of years. Um, that's a much more complicated conversation. But um, my, on my mom's side, she was, she just, why would, you know, four years ago, she literally said to me, why would you, why would you do that? You know, your problem, what your problem is, is that you just, you, you can't let go. That was her perspective four years ago. Um, but we just had a conversation like yesterday, and she has come around. She's come. There's been enough that's gone on in the world for her to understand how it connects. 
Um, and then she also understands at the core of everything that we're talking about, I'm still talking about her, right? I'm trying to understand her, what she won't, what she has originally not been willing to talk about, right? The stuff that, you know, I mean, uh, my mom, my mom, uh, what witnessed. I mean, she was around certainly un, un, around when, uh, say, St. Augustine in Florida, where they tried to integrate a school, or sorry, in, integrate a swimming pool. And they pull the black folks out of the swimming pool, or no, sorry, they pour acid into the swimming pool first, and then they pull the black folks out, and then they put an alligator. So my mom you know, definitely would have been alive in that lifetime. And why would anybody, in her mind, why would anybody want to have that conversation? And I don't, I don't argue that, right? Um, but in recent days, she's come around, she's thankful, uh, she's fearful. Um, and so I, I can't afford to have a lot of conversations with her because, it, again, it introduces fear that I can't afford to entertain. But I do acknowledge it. Um, and I have, on occasion, changed my plans because she has asked me to. Um, so uh, there, there's the thing. There are lots of folks in my family that just still don't quite understand why I'm doing it. But if I present it to them as uh, this kind of project around understanding how we work, um, it, it gets a little easier. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, as, as a teacher, oh, as, um, advisor, what kind of advice would you give folks who want to create work that has the kind of social impact that your work has the potential to do? What kind of advice? Uh, tell the truth. Find a core spiritual reason behind what you want to do. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. This, you know, if you're if you're going to start doing social, well, I, here, let me back up. I hate the term social practice because I'm just living my life and doing shit about what's going on in the world. So this thing about applying a title to it fucks me up. So I'm just going to say that. And then I'm going to say, having said that, um, if I were to encourage somebody uh, who wanted to do work like this, that had some kind of impact in their daily life, I would say, one, it is difficult. Telling the truth is fundamentally difficult. I also think it's costly. So I just need to set that up right now. Um, two, find a spiritual compass, a spiritual rationale behind doing it, and find a good network of friends around you that will support you and, tell you, tell, and support you in telling your truth. And they will tell the truth to you when you fuck up. Um, and then what's really great about doing this stuff is that because you're doing stuff that's so, how should we put it in artistic terms, edgy, um, I mean, you really get to kind of push some envelopes as far as what's acceptable in art practices. You really have an opportunity to call lots of things into question. So it opens up doors around experimentation. Um, I think you have to have some courage as far as you know getting past a, a really lovely sunset that you want to paint and get into something a little bit deeper, right? So it opens the door that way. Um, I think it's really, I think it's really exciting stuff if you have the nerves for it. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's advice per se, but that's kind of the way that I look at it. It's really, really exciting stuff. Um, it ain't a Turner, it ain't a Turner watercolor, you know? It's a whole other experience and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's certainly challenging. I, I don't know if I answered your question though. Okay. Chantel, hey. Give it to me one more time, love, because I caught half of it and then I, I literally didn't hear the rest of it. Why do you use representational materials for yeah. photo documentation and staging mm -hmm. um, as a way to uncover and pass the general material like mm -hmm. memory and trauma? I want to get all of you to a bodily understanding of what, of what I'm talking about. The difference between what I'm interested in is the difference between looking at a black and white photo and the place that we all kind of put that. It's just, it's over here. Or when you go to a movie theater 
and you look, or you go to a screening, a festival screening, and again, you're looking at a screen and it's over, it's over there, and you're passive. We're all sitting in a chair and you're just kind of watching something unfold, and it doesn't, I mean, you know, unless it's a really, 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 really intense video piece or something like that, you're not really gonna be affected by it. Uh, not in the way that I want you to be affected by it. So what I want is I wanna get past, well, what I'm trying to work around is uh, most people's rejection of what I'm trying to tell them, right? So there's this immediate, well, that's, that's not true. That, that can't be, and, you know, that's just, that's, it's repulsive, right? So I'm trying to bring as many, I'm trying to use as many strategies as I, as I possibly can to get around that. So I, by example, I reproduce the clan robes and I put them in a physical space because I want you to be able to see them. I want you to be able to touch them. I want you to actually be able to smell them. I want you to be able to hear what the fabric sounds like when you walk past because these are all things that people insist that they don't know, right? They've never seen a clan robe. They've never touched it, but there it is. Right? And that's exactly what it looks like. Or the performance, or say someone coming in and talking about nigger this, nigger that, and the way that we on an everyday level kind of censor that stuff, don't say that, right? So I'm trying to get past that. I want you to experience someone saying it, not like in some well-edited video or film, but I want you to hear it come out of people's mouth. I want you to see the spit come out of their mouth as they're talking. You know what I mean? Bodily understanding. Um, uh, by example, uh, I mean, what was really interesting about the live performance is you could smell the sweat on the actors. Like, there's things like that that really kind of matter to me. Um, I'm also kind of preoccupied with the presentation of proof, right? We're talking about an organization that is largely invisible or a secret society, and I'm trying real, real hard to bring as much of that to the forefront and give you as much proof, physical, uh, uh, reproduced, uh, reanimated proof as I possibly can. I'm working past the kind of core uh, response that most people give, which is, gee, I didn't know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does that answer it? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jean Jacques. I just had a, a question just about, I'd like to hear your comments on how viewer narratives intersect with the various black identities. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I frankly don't identify with lots of the sort of meta narratives mm -hmm. of black community. Mm -hmm. I'm not American. The Ku Klux Klan isn't really my primary uh, oppressor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually very interested in the latest um, debate in the US about Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. mainly because mm -hmm. he, as you know, um, authorized the invasion of Haiti in 1960. So these are the things that okay. are me, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Like I would go, um, I would tell her a lot more about her family coming from Haiti, right? And how yep. they got there. Yep. And how from Haiti we skipped the U.S. and got here. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in um, how your work comes in dialogue with what is in a city like Toronto, mm -hmm. the reality of, you know, Haitian, Jamaican, continental Africans, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have found being uh, descendant of this particular lineage to be a very isolating experience in Toronto. Um, to my knowledge, I'm it, right? I mean, actually, that's not, not true. There's a cousin that lives in this city as well, and we don't get along, but for all intents and purposes. <laughs> so we're gonna just assume that I didn't say that, so I am here all by myself. <laughs> um, and I've been here, what, 23, 24 years, and it has been a big challenge for me because I am that one American descended chick that doesn't fit in with the Caribbean community that was here when I got here. And so I tried really, really, really hard to fit uh, in what was a largely uh, Trinidadian community, and I didn't, uh, obviously. Uh, and so it kind of created, it just amplified the isolation for me, the feeling of not fitting in at all. Um, but I will say, because of that, or in spite of that, one of the things that I've kind of done um, just to survive, God, just to survive, is to make alliances with these same people that are not my people, right? 
um, because we are all in this Canadian tundra thing going on. And so all to, for all intents and purposes, I still need allies, right? And so we may not have the same kind of cultural background, but we do have a similarity of oppression in this country. They may play out differently, right? But at its most basic level, I know that they know what I'm talking about to some degree or another. How I got here, how they got here, that is where the split happens. But what I've done with that is just make room for them to say what they have to say. Uh, and then vice versa for me, hopefully, that's the same kind of idea. Fragmented, hell yeah. Absolutely we are fragmented, heartbreakingly so. Um, to, I will be very honest, to the, to the degree that I have definitely thought uh, in the last year about moving into the States just out of desperation. Um, it is hard. It is hard to stick it out here. It is particularly hard to stick it out here in order to try and create an education program that factors black Canadians into the equation. Um, so I stay because I'm interested in making that happen, but I may not win. Um, so I understand what you're going to tell your daughter. I get it. I mean, part of it is literally out of the fact that the education system doesn't, ac doesn't account for anybody other than uh, the British and the French, um, really. And so we're all kind of at a loss. And again, that kind of brings me back to this fragility and then the necessity of connecting because of that. We are all omitted from that narrative. You know what I mean? Um, so there's that. Um, I also, I, I, you know, everybody that I talk to that has dark skin, I'm saying, please, God, don't leave. <laughs> because I, I really need that. I need the allies. And I also just kind of hope that other people will take it upon themselves to also kind of push to get us into the textbooks. Um, there hasn't been a book on blacks in Canada since 1970. Um, and that's, I, and I mean that in all sense, like a comprehensive historical text on blacks in Canada, 1970, Robin Winks. It's tragic, right? But the only people that are going to be able to write that, cohesive or connected or not, are us, really. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Does that kind of go, does that help? Absolutely. Yeah? Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. The ones that happen here tend to focus really much on the American narrative. Cause yep. So people don't really, sh like, whenever we plan a rally in Toronto, the people will show up for Andrew Loku yep. and for Jermaine Harvey, but not to the same extent they'll come for Eric Garner mm -hmm. or Trayvon Martin or mm -hmm. Michael Brown. And these are also inherently like black men, like people who people are coming out for. But like, it's like whenever we rally for people, even here in Canada, it's, it's always an American narrative. Yep. So going on to this question, like, how do you think that bring the, that, like, how do you think that we can mobilize black, black comedians to realize that anti-black racism is also prevalent here, yeah. and the urgency needs to be the same as it is in the state, that we're also living in, like, it's like, it, it, it's, it's different kinds of op op oppression, mm -hmm. but they're still very much visible here in, the, in, our, in our policies and like in, in people who have in power, mm -hmm. and how do, we, how do we bring that to the forefront and show people that this is actually like an issue here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I have a couple thoughts on that. One, the immediate, and I just have to say these out loud because I'm going to forget them. One is acknowledging uh, the landscape that we're in, the different type of racism that we're experiencing here. It's not the American racism. It's this other thing that's kind of shrouded in a layer of repression. It doesn't exist, right? It's a racism that doesn't exist, right? So you got that. So you're working, so you can't even get to fighting the racism because you're fighting the, uh, the, the silence around the racism before you can say the thing about the race. You know what I mean? So it's that thing. Um, my aunt, I have an aunt that lives in Los Angeles, and it's really interesting because her, her partner, her lover, is, uh, grew up during the Watts riots in Los Angeles. And her perspective around race and conflict is really, really interesting. And she looks at us, my aunt and I, these Canadians, that Canadian, whichever, Canadian Americans, and she feels sorry for us because really in her mind, what we lack is a lack of community. We don't have anybody to kind of band together and fight anybody, right? And so that's the thing that she finds to be the most distinct uh, difference between the American struggle and the Canadian struggle is we're just kind of um, oppressed and individual uh, here, if that makes any sense. Um, and so we haven't quite figured out how to band together in order to name what it is that we're fighting against. It's easier 
honestly, it's easier to point to the states and see that's what we're talking about, but it's not the same, right? What I think is important to flag is that that tendency to look to the states as the, as the marker or the symbol or the, um, the example of what racism is is what the government has trained us to do. And that's a kind of critical thing to acknowledge of this displacing racism and defining it by, on American standards or by American standards, right? Um, so there's that piece. How do you rally people? Um, I, well, okay, so here's what I do. I created a list on Facebook and I just try to pump out as much black Canadian experience as I possibly can. I don't completely win. I obviously, ha um, there's also a kind of a second piece that's attached to that around contextualizing black Canadian experience within a global Afro diasporic kind of network, right? So there is, so other things kind of factor into the equation. But one of the main things that pushes against coming together is we're all I profoundly isolated and you don't even know how to reach out to the next person because you don't even know that they're there, right? You, you, don't, you wouldn't even know how to do it, so to speak, right? Um, so I think the, the most crucial thing is, uh, I mean, you have to, and I mean this, you have to fight to come together, to insist on the importance of it. Um, and then from there, uh, whittle down to the isolation and work that through. Because in my own experience, somewhere along the line that, that I'm the only one thing becomes like a poison that kind of takes over and then you really start to believe that you're the only one that's doing the work and then you kind of get drunk on it and you, and you don't really kind of do anything else. You don't reach out or anything like that. So I think that we all kind of have the potential to suffer from that, right? So you have to fight for the community thing. That is real, but you would have to do that anywhere, right? Um, anywhere, you're going to have to fight to create community. So why not here? And in my mind, what helps me to continue to do this work is the knowledge that, God, I went to a conference like a week ago, a weekend ago, and I connected to kids I had never seen before in my life. Don't even know, I have no idea where these children come from. Um, and what I was happy about was the fact that I was able to kind of, I was able to be somebody that they could tap into for a little bit, right? And so imagine yourself as being that for somebody else down the line. We all kind of have that power to kind of do that. Um, it's almost like my great uncle Bodhi at the beginning. It's, it wasn't even, it's not even about me. Like the change that I want to see, I'm not 100% sure that it'll happen in my lifetime, but I do want something to be in place for the generation after me. I have, a, I have a goal to get something in the education system. I mean, this is a start. Having this conversation at Ryerson is real and is a start. Um, I have a goal of having something in the education system before I die. Um, so that may or may not impact your lives. It might impact your kids. But I, you know, it's those kind of things that matter. It's looking ahead as much as it is looking at the present tense. Does that help? Yeah? Yes. Hey. hey. And then you. Yeah. Just in light of this discussion, one mentioned a piece of work that you actually referenced as well as you practice, mm. which is Elizabeth Alexander can't be black and look at this. I don't know if you guys know yeah. that work, but um, yeah. this speaks, you know, she is, she spoke in that work about sort of undoing the blackness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And which gives us not only the capacity to look at past trauma and to reference it to try to mediate that mm -hmm. still, but like all these examples that you just mentioned, um, and responding to that in a visceral way, because we get these incidents not just as isolated, reactive ways of responding to white supremacy, but there's a larger structural and systemic force at work that we're, that makes us respond this way. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is actually why um, tomorrow's event at UC, um, Black Radical Imagination, is important. It's not just about like responding to pathology, but mm-hmm. it's imagining, you know, something that isn't centered in, in response to this question. Yep. I agree with that. Um, Michelle and Ella would know about this. We were at a conference in Florence, Italy. It was real special, like. But it was uh, uh, a conference on black uh, portraiture in uh, art history, right? Was that how it goes? Western art, sure, whatevs. <laughs> um, it had, a cha- had its challenges, but what was interesting, there was a lot of conversation about um, enjoyment, joy in one's life, and how that is a political act. Um, I wasn't entirely convinced about that, because I'm like, you know, fuck the man, burn it down. So I really didn't understand. I really didn't understand. (laughs) Pleasure as a radical act, what? But it's true. I mean, that's very much in there. Um, It's also, you know, part of the reason why I make the work the way that I do is, uh, you know, the, the let me back up. All of the reports and all of the things that we are constantly kind of inundated with of all of this kind of world suffering and trauma on black, brown, red, Asian bodies, like all of that kind of stuff that's happening. Um, one thing that's really kind of important for me to flag is the ways in which the, all of those reports are kind of effectively the same report, right? It's the same strategy of placing uh, uh, repellent or unpleasant histories or examples or realities onto uh, other bodies. And then white folks get the pleasurable stuff over here. And that, too, is part of a very particular pattern of reporting, right? So it's really important to kind of flag that. And then that's maybe where conversations about, say, you know, pleasure as a radical act kind of fit into the equation. Um, maybe you could even put some Tyler Perry in there. That might explain that <laughs> phenomena. But uh, nonetheless, but you know, I mean, r- there's something kind of real <laughs> about kind of uh, of looking at those things as as um, important things as well, for sure, for sure. Um, Elizabeth Alexander's piece, um, "Can I Be Black and Look at This," is actually in reference to the Rodney King beatings, uh, what 1994, something like that. Um, and I used it as a reading for the beginnings of this project, really, to kind of ask questions about, well, what does it mean for me to be looking at this stuff and looking at it with such kind of uh, intensity? What does, it, what does it mean? Does it make me less black? Does it, and I definitely will say that I had those questions when I put together the show. I really wondered if somebody was going to take my black card away from me for putting it out in the world. Um, I'm not saying that these were reasonable questions, or, or, um, but I thought them anyhow. Right? I definitely thought that my identity was in question by putting uh, images like this out in the world. Um, so that's where the Elizabeth Alexander piece comes into the equation. And I, I put it to you all because in some way or another, you're going to have to, to, to counteract the ways in which the media represents and assigns this particular history to us you have to figure out a way of flipping this, which means that you're going to have to go against current, which means that you're going to do stuff that's uncomfortable, and it's going to make you question who you are. Um, It's going to make you question whether or not you're kind of in line with your community, if you are thinking the right things, doing the right things. But it's kind of, it's it's a trick. It's not quite the, it's not the right language. It's it's a, it's not true, effectively. It's, it's, you are, I would say you're even on the right path once you start to feel those things, because once you get to the other side, you know that you've kind of flipped something for real. Does that make sense, soon? Yeah? Um, do I answer everything, give or take? Yeah? Bria.
brought up to believe that clearly is playing it's broken, it's not clear. Mm-hmm. And so I mean that still exists in my community setting right now, which is kind of scary. But in my critique, I was told that the work that I'm doing belongs in Belize, and it doesn't really have a place in Canada. Um, you know that's whack, right? You know that's like, <laughs> you know that's batshit crazy, like right now, right? Yeah. Okay. Just, just saying, yeah. just saying. Okay. It was disappointing because I really respect that professor, and I felt really alone being the only black body in that classroom. And so I'm just wondering if that's the kind of response that um, you also go through when you're trying to show your work in the Canadian gallery. Yep. Up against, oh, this doesn't belong in the Toronto gallery. It definitely belongs in like um, a U.S. gallery. A, the place that you're trying to, you know. Yes. 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 Um, Yes, in many ways. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I can say that that was my experience going through undergrad. That was my experience, well, no, let me back up. That was my experience going through high school. That was my experience going through undergrad. Uh, and I went to undergrad in Vancouver, uh, and I was that only one um, kind of carving out a place for myself and literally going cray cray, just crazy for the isolation again. Uh, and having to educate my professors as I educated myself. Uh, and then I also experienced that in grad school here in Toronto, again, educating my educators as I went through. I was very fortunate to find solace in other departments. Um, the history department at U of T um, is huge in my, tra in my world. Um, I like historians because they just, you know, deal with like history and facts and they just tell the truth, right? A truth, depending on the histor history person. <laughs> depending on the history person you're dealing with, right? But I happened to run into good history people and they were truthful. Um, but in the art world, um, uh, you know, aside from my family and not wanting to deal with their stuff, a lot of what I did the first 10 years of my practice in Toronto is a reflection of this city. Um, because when I got here, uh, specifically in film video, it was like, well, you know, but you're black, so you make black work, right? And that's like, well, well, actually, I can talk about a lot of things other than black things, right? Uh, and people were just absolutely confused about, well, you know, well, what else would, uh, what do you mean you talk about other things? You only talk about black things. So I got shitty and refused to use the black body overall and insisted that people read the work. So the first 10 years was partly about insisting that white gallery people read the work. If I take the black body out, if, you know, if I take that out altogether, you're obliged to read the material in front of you. That didn't happen. And actually what I got was just more bullshit to kind of work through around kind of the various, the many, many uh, ways in which they kept trying to put black on me. Um, so there's that piece, but it was still, I, I think it was an important thing for me to experience because it just gave me an opportunity to work through just about every way in which a white gallery person could dismiss the work, right? Uh, it was really painful, again, really isolating, full of shit, it sucked. Um, then I started making work uh, with the black body, and then that just brought up a whole other wave of things, of, of other types of responses. Uh, then it was white curators saying, well, I can't, I can't write about this because, you know, it's your experience. So that, just like that, that double kind of edge thing of, on the one hand, they, want, they, they really want to hear about your stuff. They really want to be there for you, right? And then when you give it to them, <laughs> then they're just like fucked up because they can't, they, well, uh, I can't talk to that, right? So you're kind of screwed in every kind of way that you go. But the, but the thing is, is uh, and, and specifically with this body of work, lots of conversations about, yeah, you know, this, is, this is great. So you ever tried showing it in the States? How would it go there? That was how, that, that was how this was re received. How would, that, how would that work in the States? And then when I went to the States and it went over well, then they're just like, oh, fuck. Because we ain't got any place to send her now, right? <laughs> like this, everybody's kind of, you know, it's, it's just us, fuck, right? <laughs> so uh, there's those pieces. This is real. This is, this is the art world uh, for black and brown people. This is this reality. Now, what you get when you go to the States is you get more people that are like you that are working this out. That doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to get black faculty that are going to help you through. 
Um, sometimes you might, you, get, you have a higher possibility of getting that in the States, but you're not, uh, well, the numbers just aren't great for black faculty in higher institutions overall. And then within studio arts, it gets thinner, but you have a better chance there. Having said that, this won't change if we all leave. And I've talked to you guys about this, a whole bunch about this. Really, this scenario of white folks in Toronto and Canada not knowing how to deal with black work won't change if we all say, fuck it, and go to the States. It won't change. That doesn't mean I want you to stay here and suck it up and be miserable, but I do, I just need to say that. <laughs> I just need to say that. That is a truth about it, right? Um, and then even if you go into an international platform, I went to, I, I was uh, at the Venice Biennale, Okwi and Wazar was there, first African curator in the Venice Biennale's history, which is 100 and blah, 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 million gazillion years. Um, and the pushback against the inclusion of 35 black artists in that uh, world exhibition was phenomenal. Lots of conversation about the work being unfinished. Uh, and crude and, um, you know, I mean, bullshit, like, you know, just shy of savage, right? Um, this is the art world. Um, I don't really have a solution for the pain of this, this part of it, um, but I do think it's critically important that we continue to make the work. I mean, there are some other solutions. Create your own space, which is real. Um, find other allies and I mean having said all of these things about the difficulty of it all I have found fabulous allies other people that get it um, so there are lots of dumbasses I will say that but there are also some really great people that fall that are fitting in between it that do kind of pick you up your circumstances are lousy because you're just in a yeah you're just in a lousy place really uh, in a lousy scenario in a in a, oh wow, I have to be careful now because I want to be able to work. Um, <laughs> but your work, I mean, you're in a Canadian institution, right? You're in a Canadian institution in Toronto and you're at a campus that has some issues with race overall. And so I don't know what to, I don't know how to get you through that other than to continue to talk to you as I have always done outside of and off that campus and help you kind of get through that way. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate one thing you said about finding that community. Yeah. Because even the catalyst of this conversation for me was hearing these, you know, stories of the perspective of a, you know, Haitian yeah. and, and you know, Creole language and da 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 da. Yeah. I love what happens in the coming together. Yeah. You know, just I think that there's so many instances where we do get put down and where we put each other down. And what I find the inspiration of hope comes from is often from in the sharing. Yeah. You know, there's one person who says something that is very, you know, not graceful. You know, but racist, do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was graceful. That was nice. And <laughs> as I look around, there's some incredible individuals doing such inspiring yep. work. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the challenges of doing this body of work was, what, and one of the things I didn't expect was the local pushback against, uh, from the black, from a pocket of black artists um, about this body of work, and it fucked me up. I was just, I was devastated. But other people know this history and have been phenomenally supportive of me. So Francophones came out, Queers came out, Mennonites came out, their uh, First Nations artists came out, Jews came out. There are a whole bunch of other people that have been profoundly supportive of what I do and understand the world uh, in a way that is counter mainstream narrative. Lots and lots and lots of people. One of the things about being in Canada and being those only ones is like you just spend, you can get lost spinning out trying to find other black people. Uh, and then you miss the fact that you've got other allies that are already there as well. That, you know, it's, um, this is a bit of a segue, but it, ma it, but it connects in so much as uh, the byproduct of my research was my American family that we had left behind 100 years ago came to a family reunion 
uh, in Alberta five years, four years ago. And my black American relatives were just completely dumbfounded because we had a Sunday service and we, in Amber Valley, uh, we practiced, we, we were in church with the white community that surround us and the black folks from the states just could not understand it. They, you, you worship with white people? Like that just blew their minds. Um, my, our American family was just so um, comfortable, so to speak, with uh, only dealing with black people that they missed the, all these other people that were out in the world. So that kind of really kind of registered in my mind. There's an oppression that we can fall into all on our own um, that I try to kind of pay attention to and get around. And again, just for the sheer number, the tundra of this place, right? You just have to reach out to other people. You, you just have to. Um, and if we want to bring forward any kind of consciousness about race in this country, we are obliged to connect to anybody and everybody that is on the same page. We just have to. Yeah. These days, um, I am finding the most spiritual um, uh, support from my indigenous friends as I come further into embracing my black Indian lineage, which is hard because it's got all kinds of other things kind of going on. But uh, those are the people that have, uh, have been the most support to me as of late. And they are people that I would never necessarily have thought to look to, but they have, open, they have welcomed me with open arms and I'm deeply grateful. We gotta wrap this up. The nice lady's doing this thing. <laughs> so, so unless there is anything absolutely, I missed that whole damn side because I was leaning like this. I missed y'all. So if there was a question over there, I'm so sorry. Um, is there anything that anybody wants to throw out on the table? Uh, anything that anybody wants to discuss? I know there's the Black, Knife, Black, Black Lives Matter uh, event that's coming up. Black Radical Imaginations tomorrow, six o'clock at Innis. Uh, any, anything? Bedtime? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.